They're jumping on each other. One of the most unbelievable finishes you will ever see. And welcome to it. Thanks for being with us on Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Lite, Brett Hollander, along with Jeff Arnold, just a couple of broadcasters, talking some baseball shop. Jeff, how are you? Brett, I'm doing great. Good to be back with you on, a, on another Thursday. Pretty excited for our guest today in uh, Bill Ripken. I think that ought to be a, a great conversation where we talk about, obviously, the game that we're going into today from 2012, but also to talk a little bit more about baseball and his take on the current status of the game. Yeah, he just came out with a new book, which I have officially perused because uh, I got it a few months ago. You know, Bill, I would define as an old school guy, but listen, here's a guy who's a prominent spot on MLB Network. Uh, he's got to be able to talk the numbers of the game, and he and I have had this conversation before. You've got to be able – to combine these two things. They do not have to live apart like I think some people want it to live apart. And I don't think one can stand by itself. You do need to understand that the numbers and the analytics and the different metrics that you can use to judge players, those do have a, a place in the game, obviously, and are important and can help you figure out certain things about, about needs in your organization and, and what you're looking for and, and what optimally will allow you to compete at the highest level. I understand that. But at the same time, you need to make sure that you're getting players that have the proper mental makeup and are ready to go out there to compete. Because if you throw 100 miles an hour, that's great. But if you can't understand scouting reports or you're not able to understand any of the other elements or, or whatever that you need to, uh, that can really put your organization in a, in a challenging position. So I do believe that there are spots for both, like you said, in the game today. I think at times, though, the challenge is getting one side to work with the other side to produce a product that you know, ultimately uh, will allow you to succeed on the field. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It does not have to become adversarial, which is the way it's oddly become in baseball. You know, I'm looking around uh, all of these other professional sports, and there's a huge infusion of analytics and numbers and new data in every sport. I'm not an expert on any of it. I want to pretend to be. But there's not this animosity of one side versus the other. And, and if I were a GM, and I'm not, I'm not, Jeff. I should not. I'm not. <laughs> but if I were one, I'd want to employ a lot of people with a lot of different opinions. And that's up to me to kind of filter out what's really necessary in, in a given thing. I'm not saying you can't have a, a compass or a guide and, and lean one way. But listen, uh, I think we're, we're pretending sometimes that we're reinventing the wheel. I agree. And there's always an opportunity for one side to learn a little bit more about what the other side brings to the table because you're trying to present the, your players with as broad of a picture of the game as you possibly can get. And you want to expose them to a bunch of different things. And it's, it's not just the numbers. It's not just what somebody's, you know, KVS score is or, or any of these other, you know, new things, but you also want to, you know, expose them to, you know, thinking about sequencing and what the pitcher is trying to accomplish uh, and uh, understanding how to, to get through, you know, the season the right way. And, and, you know, I think there's still value to, to that type of stuff, to taking your ground balls every day, to doing the same kind of exercises and practicing relays and all these other things that have been done since the, the start of time in baseball. There is still a place for those things. And it's important that you continue to execute those things because it doesn't necessarily matter if you've got a great range factor or whatever, and you can get into the hole and pick up a ball. If you can't make an accurate throw to first base or wherever it's going, it's not going to make a, a whole lot of a difference. And the other thing we're going to talk with uh, Bill about besides his new book is a specific day and uh, a game we're looking back on uh, coming up in our uh, Orioles uh, Twitter live uh, replays and, and Orioles on deck coming up. But September 6, 2012, I can honestly say, Jeff, it's one of my favorite games in Orioles history. And it involves a few factors. One, uh, at the ballpark that night, uh, we all kind of woke up around Labor Day in 2012 and said, the Orioles are in contention. I mean, forget about ending 14 years of losing. Forget about just making the playoffs. I mean, they are in firm contention for an American League East title with the, with the hated Yankees of all teams. And those two clubs went neck and neck all summer and really fall long into October. 
And the Yankees were in town for a four-game series. It's game one of the series, and it's Cal Ripken night at the ballpark. It's September 6th. It's the anniversary of 2131, and that always has something extra added to an Orioles night at Camden Yards. But also that night, in a summer where they unveiled all the great statues uh, beyond the bullpens at Camden Yards, that was the night they were unveiling the Cal Ripken statue. And it was just a tone of feeling in that ballpark we have not felt in some time. And the Orioles came out like gangbusters. Matt Wieters hit a three-run homer in the first inning that, you know, I, I said this then, I think I said it on Twitter, and the, the history of Twitter can, can back me up on this, that if there was a lid or a roof on Oriole Park at Camden Yards that night, on that Wieters three-run homer, it would have blown clear off. I mean, just up and away. And then the Orioles built a 6-1 lead, and uh, they blew that lead. And then Adam Jones, it's a big eighth inning home run. And it was kind of the statement saying that we're for real. We're not going away. And then they hit a bunch of home runs at inning. They win the game 10 to six. And, uh, it, and then a few days later, oddly enough, that uh, it was also kind of infamous. CC Sabathia hit Nick Markakis in his hand, uh, all but knocking him out for the postseason, which was very detrimental to the Orioles. But that series was split. The teams had the same record, identical records at the end of it. They play neck-and-neck neck baseball, 9-9 nine and nine versus each other, all regular season long. Of course, the Orioles lost uh, game five of the divisional series to New York. But it was just a – it was it was the playoffs. We're turning to Cam Yards as far as I'm, I'm concerned. And Bill and Cal both gave great speeches that night. And we'll talk to Billy about that coming up. Well, one of the pieces in Cal's speech was – and this got the – crowd fired up before the game was that we are used to playing meaningful baseball in September yep. in yep. Baltimore. And as I went back and, and looked at some of the old articles written from that game, there was one person who attended, they got there an hour before the game. And it was like, this place is already packed at the time. Adam Jones said it was the loudest that he had heard Camden yards and it had the playoff atmosphere that gave you the sense that this year is a lot different than those other 14 years. So it was great to see uh, that particular night and kind of fitting that on a night where Cal's statue was unveiled, it was the eighth inning where the Orioles were able to get that big home run from Adam and, and I believe the number eight was on the warehouse that night. And, uh, yeah, I don't want to be too corny about it, but I remember after Jones hit his home run the eighth inning, I had to take a walk around the concourse and then Reynolds went deep and Davis went deep and it just had a, um, it, it just was something I had to feel again. And, and that's how special that night was. So uh, we'll bring on now our guest for this edition of Orioles magic podcast. And it's time for our guest right now. And it is former Oriole and MLB network's own bill Ripken. Bill, how are you holding up during these times? I hope you and your family are healthy and well. Uh, I think we're just like everybody else. Uh, we leave when we have to, but for the most part, we're hunkered down. And hopefully, uh, if we all keep doing this and everybody does enough of it, maybe we can talk baseball for real sometime this summer in a, in a more normal atmosphere. That sure sounds good. But in the meantime, let's talk baseball uh, from once upon a time. We want to get into your book, of course, but also uh, we were – uh, looking back at this, one of my favorite games, and, and I know you've obviously seen a lot uh, in your time, both as a player, in coaching, and obviously in broadcasting, but September 6, 2012, the anniversary of 2131, they unveil the Ripken statue at Camden Yards. The Yankees are in town. The Orioles are trying to end 14 years of losing, of missing the playoffs, and all of a sudden, it's like the playoffs return to Camden Yards for the first time in 14 years. Different kind of atmosphere. Uh, and you gave, and I remember being on the radio live uh, as we were airing your speech, one of the best speeches, and essentially in defense or a total and complete rejection of the critics of 2131 and, and just the streak as a whole, it was one of the more sealed tight, crushing blows to any of those people over the years. Well, I think over the time, um, and isn't it a sad state when you face criticism meaning Cal faced criticism over the time for wanting to go to work every day. That's a little bit of a sad state. And believe me, the streak was not about him. He was never setting out to do it. But I remember after I think his rookie of the year and his MVP season back to back, I think he got a four year deal out of the mix. And I remember senior telling him, all right, they're paying you pretty good money for coming to the yard every day and playing short. 
And so if Junior took that and ran with it, it's nothing more than a son's respect for a father to go out there and do your job. And the selfish part that always entered into this when people would talk about Cal really graded on me because I believe Junior's numbers would be better. His Hall of Fame numbers, you know, the, the counting numbers would be better if he was selfish. And instead of being 0 for 15 and Nolan Ryan pitching the next day, he would say, you know what, I'm taking that day off. Because when you're 0 for 15, you're scuffling. And when you're facing Nolan Ryan the next day, you might be hanging with an 0 for 18 or an 0 for 19 on your ledger. And I played with guys that would take days off. And I believe they took days off because of selfish reasons. And Junior, if he was selfish for wanting to go out and be a part of a team and be a good teammate for a thousand years in a row like he did, then so be it. But it really graded on me when I would hear people say he was selfish. It's all about the streak. It wasn't all about the streak. It was about him being a good teammate. And no matter if he was struggling or not, he gave us a better opportunity to win when he was playing. How did that kind of you know galvanize everybody else as well, knowing that he was going to be out there on an everyday basis? Like, did that provide a certain amount of energy and security for everybody else on the team, knowing that, okay, no matter what he's dealing with, Junior's going to be in the lineup? Well, I, I think there's a stability, and I think all good teams have that stability. I mentioned Senior getting a little bit of credit for saying go out there and do your job. Eddie Murray also was one that Cal points at that – Cal, uh, Eddie told Cal, he goes, I don't care if we're struggling or not. When you're hitting third and I'm hitting fourth, we're a better team. We need to be in there every single day. And I like to point out, if you go back and look at Eddie Murray's bold print, there's some 162s in his ledger too on games played during the year. So uh, when you have the influence of, the, of your dad and senior, and then you come up to the big leagues and you have the influence of Eddie Murray, who's the bopper hitting in the middle of the lineup, two pretty good influences to have. And he provided a stability that everybody enjoyed. In fact, I think Junior was ready to take a day off one day. Might have told Sutcliffe that I'm thinking about taking a day off. And Sut says, well, you better not do it when I'm pitching because I need to turn around and see you playing shortstop because you give me the best chance. If you want to take a day off, pick on somebody else that's on the mound, but don't use me. Yeah, that's a great point. I imagine a lot of starting pitchers had that same feeling. And just from a, the standpoint of, you know, you play maybe 10 or 11 innings on a Saturday night. It's, it's July in Baltimore. It's August in Baltimore. Day game after a night game to play a demanding position like shortstop. It would be the easier choice to say, you know what, have someone else go do this for one day. Yeah, and, you know, you mentioned about 10 or 11 innings in one day. The fact that he didn't miss an inning <laughs> from 1982 to 1987 – <laughs> and I remember that time the senior was the manager in Toronto. Toronto had 10 big flies off of us in old exhibition stadium prior to the dome. And I remember junior was on the bases. I reached down to pick up his glove and his hat, going to take it out to him because the third out was made and senior whistled. And I looked down at him. He goes, shook his finger. No. And junior was coming off the field. Ronnie Washington ran out and played shortstop. Uh, to end that game in, in Toronto. So the fact that Junior played every single game, the fact that he's in the 95th percentile of innings played during that streak shows you it wasn't one A, B, and take it to the house. The man went out there every single inning. Hmm. You've heard this before probably that, that Cal, even as he dealt with some of these ailments, he had these incredible healing powers. Were you able to kind of witness that up, up close in person? And, and do you sort of feel like that some bumps and bruises other guys wouldn't necessarily be able to deal with as well? He could just deal with a lot better? Well, there was no doubt that there were guys that they had some similar stuff that Junior had over his playing days, would not have played, uh, maybe been on the DL, um, me included. Um, but Junior always had that some sort of healing power that was kind of abnormal. And even during the time, and he was legal to play basketball in his gym because that was part of his conditioning. You'd hear an ankle roll and you'd hear a pop and he'd start limping around, um, make you feel awfully bad if it was your foot that he stepped on because he'd be screaming. And next thing you know, he walks it off and he's running up and down the court playing. Um, he's always had a desire to go out there. And in fact, it could even go back to our backyard games in the driveway playing hoops. Junior would get mad 
if you wanted to go in and get a PBJ. Uh, he wanted to stay out and play. So his desire to be out there, his desire to compete was always real. And I don't think you can do what he did unless you were able to do that. And, and yeah, maybe to Jeff's point also, maybe it's a, a genetic thing just to heal and, and the competitiveness, uh, something freakish, right? Uh, freakish is a nice word for him. And we mean that in the nicest of ways. Um, he was, he was always um, uh, able to post. And that was one of some, I guess the proudest moment he could have. And as you know, when you hear him talk about the streak and what would happen, he said it was a product of the manager writing his name in the lineup every day um, because he was the best option. And those are really good things to have. Um, having to come into the locker room like myself, peek around the corner to look at the lineup card was a little bit discerning sometimes. But for Junior, you didn't have to look at the lineup card. You knew the guy was going to post his name in the lineup and the guy writing out the lineup, and he had a lot of them, always knew he was going to post. Heard that Cal liked to wrestle. We had Rick Sutcliffe on recently. Uh, how, many, uh, how many times was somebody able to pin Cal? Did it ever happen? I don't think I ever saw that one. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, there was guys that um, – uh, I, I know when Devereaux came over. And Ju De Devereaux told Junior, because Junior, I ain't playing that game. I see what you do all the time. We're not doing that. And other guys would try. And they'd end up on the training table somehow, some way. They'd end up with their arms wrapped all up around them like a cobra. And his knuckle would find a way in their rib cage, and he'd start grinding on it. And I heard grown men squeal like pigs um, as a result of that. But, no, I didn't necessarily see uh, Junior ever flat on his back. I tell you who would like to do it with him was Ben, though. <laughs> Big Ben at six foot seven, and we know jumping out of boats on gators doesn't make you normal. So Ben always had an aptitude or a desire to get after it with Junior a little bit. So we were talking to Stuckcliffe. We went back and looked at opening day in 1992, the opening of the ballpark, a, an important day in Orioles history, baseball history, Baltimore history. And famously, you know, you don't get the first RBI, but you have the famous squeeze play in the game. And TV misses it, showing the Hoyles uh, double to the gap. Yeah, shocker. Um, that's, uh, that's me playing victim again. Um, you can try to go back and find it, and you see one, like, side view of me squaring around late to get it down. But the funny thing about that, when Hoyles hit that um, RBI double to left center ground rule, I believe, um, Leo Gomez was on first, Sam Horn was on second. Sam Horn scores, Leo gets around to third base. I knew when everything was going on that Johnny Oates was going to put that on when I started walking up. So it was real easy to look at Senior in the third base box and, and look for the sign before anybody else was looking at you. And I didn't even have to give an answer because Senior knew if he gave it to me, I was going to get it. Usually you have to give an answer if you're the guy at home plate because you don't want the guy running down the third baseline and have the guy swing. But Senior knew what was happening. And Leo, because Nagy was on the bump, Leo got a really good early jump, almost too good. Um, because I'm sitting there, saw him out of the corner of the eye when he ran, and I'm going, okay, Nagy might throw one up and in on me because he left that early, which means he left a little bit too soon for the process. But the fact that a breaking ball was called, you can't change your mind on that one. So Nagy flipped up a high breaking ball. I ended up getting it down, and we ended up getting the second run of the game, and Sutt went out there and put a complete game. Had a pretty generous strike zone that day, if you remember on – couple of those pitches getting a little bit out there, but uh, that was fun to see Sut. That's answering the call pretty good coming over and being the number one starter. What was your first reaction the, the first time you, you went into Camden Yards? Well, um, this is pretty incredible. Um, I remember when we left uh, Memorial 91, last day of the season, I thought there was nothing wrong with Memorial Stadium until we showed up at Camden Yards. Then you could find a laundry list of things that why you didn't want to play at Memorial Stadium anymore. But Memorial Stadium certainly served its purpose. It was a really nice yard to play in. Um, I think teams enjoyed coming in and playing in that one. But Camden Yards, and I don't say this because I'm biased with Baltimore, because Baltimore has fired me twice. Um, I say Camden Yards is still the best yard in all of baseball, regardless of all the new ones, you know, that, that have been built since. So 
when they built Camden, they built it right because it's still the number one park in baseball. We had a really fun time going back and looking at that 92 team. You know, in 90-91, the team's not very good. And really outside 89, it, it was a struggle for a number of those years in the back half of the 80s. And you have a 92 team that wins 89 games in that ballpark. And you have Mussina, McDonald to go along with Sutt. I mean, those are two, you know, high first round picks. You know, McDonald won overall. Olsen, who's the number two pick, I think, in, uh, in what, 88. And then – a really good cast around even uh, some of the more known guys who were on the team. But you had you, you had guys like Horn and Gomez, and Hoyles becomes a true everyday player. Devro has a big year. Brady has a huge year. Uh, it was a really good team in 1992. It, it was. And I think the staple behind that team is we caught the ball really well. I think a lot of our teams did. But the outfield fence of Camden Yards – kind of played in to the athleticism, I believe. Because usually when you talk about catching the ball real well, you really look at the infielders because the majority of the outs are still made in there, your total chances and everything else. But there were some guys that were going out there and robbing homers and making plays in the gap and kind of demoralizing some of the other team. But uh, you, you mentioned the fact that we went out there in 189, um, pretty good year. And I think we did that because – we felt real good going into that yard plan every day. Um, but, but catching the ball, anchored once again by Junior, Leo did a nice job playing third base. Um, so Hoyles was another good mention, too, because Hoyles had a little issue throwing to second base. Um, didn't necessarily throw like the other catchers. But as far as receiving the play and blocking balls in the dirt, you'd have to go back and be very hard-pressed to find when base runners gain 90 feet from balls bouncing in the dirt and carry them off him too far. He smothered baseballs in the dirt extremely well. The pitchers all like throwing to him. And I think those two things probably outweigh throwing out base runners anyway. What was it like getting to, to play up the middle with Junior on, a, on an everyday basis when you really didn't have a whole lot of time uh, to be able to play with him when you were growing up? Well, no time to play with him when we were growing up unless they were backyard games, um, which is also kind of funny because – a lot of people just assume when we grew up, senior saw us play a lot. Senior saw us play when we played with him uh, at the big league level. There was very few times he saw us play a high school game. I think I only remember one high school game that he ever came to of mine. Um, he would make a certain trip or two to the minor league city that I was in and maybe see a game a year. Um, but for the most part, when I got to spring training the first time in 87 as a, as a roster player and went into spring training, he got to see – I guess both of us play together, but uh, who would be uh, disappointed playing alongside Junior? Um, I still think when I look back at my career, I didn't have the career that Junior had as far as moments or memories. But then again, 99% of people that played in the big leagues didn't have the career that Junior had either. Uh, I do think I turned more double plays as a second baseman with Junior than any other second baseman that he ever played with. And I think that was an awful lot of fun to do that. Um, the very first one we turned was against Minnesota. Uh, it was a 4-6-3 double play, and it just seemed pretty natural. Maybe we had some communication skills without having to be able to speak because we were brothers, but being alongside him and being in between Eddie and him, it's a pretty good way to start your career. Uh, Bill, uh, before we get into your new book, uh, State of Play, which I, I, I think is really interesting, and I know – uh, your sense of the numbers and what should be emphasized and not and how we can bring it all together. Uh, I do want to go back quickly to that 92 team. We asked Sud about Mike Mussina, who uh, had such a dominant first full season, a rookie season in 1992. Did you have a sense then that that guy could wind up in Cooperstown while watching him pitch in 92? I think I had a sense that I watched him throw a bullpen session in spring training, that there was something different about this guy. And I'm getting to the point now with the new inductions into the Hall of Fame that I kind of remove myself from the opinion of it because I'm a see it and feel it guy. You talk about the new book we're going to talk about. I believe in that. Um, I have a hard time trying to equate all the numbers into certain things. Um, when I face Nolan Ryan, when I face Randy Johnson, when I face Pedro Martinez, there's something different about those guys you're facing than the other guys in the big leagues. And I watched Mike Mussina warm up one time, 
And I remember, I think his first spring training outing was against the Blue Jays, I believe in Dunedin. I think he threw 10 pitches, struck out three people, one, two, three, <laughs> in 10 pitches, walked off the mound. And I was playing second. I ran off. I go, damn, there's something different about this dude. And when you see something like that, and then you watch him go out there and pitch, and you watch him compete, um, you, you fall in love with the idea that he's a great teammate. All those things entered into it, but there was no doubt. When Moose took the mound, it was different than most any other person that took the mound. Going into your book, what was kind of the, the impetus that, that led you to start writing? I mean, what was kind of be behind the decision to, you know, let's take all these thoughts and things that I've seen and things that I've kind of thought and, and put it down on paper? Well, I think first and foremost, there's been this uh, – domino effect of the new school conversation that's been going on. And I think over the last three years, there's a little bit of an innuendo that old school guys aren't smart. Old school guys don't use numbers. Old school guys don't use information. We just go out there and fly by the seat of the pants. That's not the case. Old school guys have always used numbers. Old school guys have always used information to come up with a plan. There may be more things now more information more numbers to come into play but it's not that a new school guy is smarter it's not that there's this new way to go about things and I just kind of first and foremost wanted to point out that old school guys like Earl Weaver he could figure out how to get their worst bullpen guy in the game against a pinch hitting Terry Crowley or Benny Ayala now, if that's not using numbers and information, now, it's not off a spreadsheet. It's in his brain. When Senior used to fill out a three-by-five index card when he was managing Doug DeSensei in AA in Asheville, North Carolina, if he saw something happen during the night, that's information. Those are numbers. And he would address that the next day when he came into the, to the clubhouse. Johnny Oates had a simple yes-no in his back pocket with the index cards because he went yeah. and looked at the numbers – on, okay, you can hit off of this guy or you can't. And it was a yes, no, check or an X. Um, and that's not to say that those three guys that I just mentioned, Earl, Dad, and Johnny, wouldn't use new numbers and new information, but they have to apply to the game. And I think all this conversation coming in that the new school's now in control, the new school's in charge, there's a little bit of a slight that the old school guy wasn't very smart and he just went by gut instinct. That's just not the case. And I couldn't agree with you more. And then let's take it a step further with Earl. I mean, known for valuing. I mean, at its core, most of these new offensive numbers are about valuing your chances and your outs. Here's someone who's played historically for the three-run homer. I mean, that was his thing. Get guys on base, you know, value the walk. You know, it turns out throughout most of history, a lot of the best hitters also walked a lot. I mean, that you go, I was going back and, you know, I'm rewatching Ken Burns baseball now just because of, we have some extra time on our hands. And, I, you know, they mentioned a guy, Honus Wagner. Oh, yeah, it turns out he walked a lot. You know, Babe Ruth, he walked a lot. And, got, and pitchers would pitch around those guys. And, and the guys who can really hit well also usually have good batting eyes. Why did Ken Singleton lead off all those games for Earl Weaver? It wasn't because he was going to be your fast, you know, guy to steal a bag or two. It's because he walked. And then right. same thing with, with Johnny Oates. You know, why, do you, why was Jim Poole in your bullpen? To get the opposing left-hander out late in the game. I mean – it, it stands true throughout time. We're not reinventing the wheel, I think, the way some people want us to believe we are. Correct. Uh, I'm 100% on board. And if Ken Singleton did lead off, it was because Earl didn't have a necessarily another option. But when you look at what they were doing nice, he was hitting fifth because he was an RBI machine behind Eddie Murray. And, yes, I said RBI because the run batted in still plays in my world. If we need runs to win games, we need to score runs to win games. We need guys to be able to drive them in. And I think when you have a 3-4 combination, the junior and Eddie, and then you put Singy right behind them, we can compare that group to possibly what the Washington Nationals did last year. With Rendon, their best hitter hit third. Not second, like some of these teams are thinking. He hit third. Drove in more runs than anybody else on the planet. And then the young Buck Soto still drove in 100 runs behind him. So the idea of this new school and the new thought process of where our best hitters in, I'm not so sure that it necessarily comes into play. And their individual numbers might spike with some of the columns that they like talking about, but is it the most productive spot 
for Mike Trout to be hitting second and not driving in 100 runs for me. Um, I, I believe in my best hitter's got to have an opportunity in the first inning to hit with possibly men on base. And when you hit second, you're cutting his chances down drastically of hitting in the first inning alone with a man on base. How do you think you get the new school and the old school to come together? Because there's value on both sides, but at times from, from my experience working with some teams that are a little bit more into the numbers and the analytics and some that maybe aren't quite as, as far there yet, there, there seems like there's a resistance to maybe collaborate. Well, I think for the most part, we have decent collaboration going on. And, and let's look at it this way. I believe there are two trees. We have the new school tree and the old school tree. There's a couple branches on the new school tree that are borderline arrogant. There's a couple of trees, branches on the old school tree that are borderline bullies. I believe that, and those branches are never getting together. We can just <laughs> throw that out there right now. But the idea of collaboration, um, I believe Sherholtz and Bobby Cox had pretty decent collaboration over time. If I'm your guy's old school manager and you're my new school front office and you bring me five nuggets down into my office, give them to me. And I'm going to say, thanks, guys. This is good stuff. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I'm going to take two of the five. Use them. The other three, you got to go back to the drawing board. I hope you two guys don't tell me, oh, he's rigid. He's unwilling to change. No, the difference between old and new school is the people hanging out on the old school tree that have baseball experience, this tree doesn't have that. So you've got you've to rely on each other to get things done. I'm all for new thoughts, new ideas. If you're smart, bring it. But I hope that if you give me something and I say I can't use that, I'm not being rigid. I'm just applying it to the real baseball world that no, um, you know, insult. You don't have any responsibility or any understanding of what I know about that. Bill, have the fundamentals of the game changed? In other words, how you make a, a, a stop deep in the hole shortstop and, and pick it and, and how you uh, turn a double play around the bag at second, how you fundamentally pick up a ground ball or charge one, hit slowly down the third base line. Have those, what is required of you mentally and physically and the fundamentals of those things, has that changed at all in this time? I, I believe not, no. In fact, I still sit there and say, if you go to the game and you put on noise-canceling headphones and watch the game, you're going to see a few more overshifts than the, you used to see. But my father used to say, you pitch it, you catch it, you hit it better than the other team, and you win. And the fundamentals of pitching it, hitting it, and catching it, I don't believe have changed one bit. Um, we can talk all about the new wave thought of hitting and the conversation that swirls around launch angle. Dude, I can marry up guys playing now to guys playing back in yesteryear, and their swings look pretty similar. I also go to spring training and watch these guys hit nothing but rockets back up the middle against the back wall of the cage. Nothing different than when I saw Cal and Eddie Murray doing it on an everyday basis. Not one player that I went to and saw doing drills through the network and everything else in spring training even mentioned or uttered launch angle in any of their conversation. And the idea of now launch angle is entered into the game, there's a big misconception. Launch angle is not the swing. Launch angle is nothing more than the ball coming off the bat. So are you telling me Babe Ruth didn't have a launch angle when he hit a homer? Sure he did. We just couldn't measure it. But the swing is the swing. And I believe these kids' swing is from 10 years old when they're out in the backyard and they establish themselves as being pretty good. You'll find that their swing looks pretty much identical to when, it, when they were 10 years old. We can change this a little bit. We can change the thought process. We might pick our spots to go bridge. But launch angle is one of those things in 2018, Mookie Betts won the MVP in the American League with an 18.4 average year-long launch angle. Yelich won the MVP in the National League with an average year-long launch angle of 4.9 degrees. Yelich at 36 bombs, Mookie at 32. So there is no one-size-fits-all. To hear somebody, and in, in taking off my noise-canceling headphones, to hear somebody say, 
oh, he worked on his launch angle or he improved his launch angle. And if those are the only two things you're bringing to the table, you can't sit at my table because those things mean nothing to me. There is no one size fits all. These players go out there and hit. They see the ball. They hit the ball. If it goes up and they hit it hard enough, it leaves. This day and age, this is something you talked about in the book, wins above replacement. It tries to put a measure on somebody's value in terms of, you know, what they can provide to a team off of just one number. What are some of the things that are inherently just don't make that a good, a good way of, of looking at a player's value? Well, from the way it was described to me, because if I try to read it, dude, I'm off. Because you start going through these things and try to read some of these definitions and they will hurt you. The way it was explained to me to begin with wins above replacement. The replacement player was a readily available AAA player or a guy that was off the bench. And I go back to 2015, Jackie Bradley Jr. of the Boston Red Sox was sent down four times to Pawtucket, four. But yet at the end of the year, he had a 2.3 war. By very definition, he should be a wins above Jackie Bradley Jr. Because he was the guy <laughs> that was replacing the guy at the big league level. So when you see things like that, I don't quite understand it. And then we go back to the 2018 Red Sox. They won 108 games, I believe, during the regular season. But if you add up everybody's wins above replacement, it was like 57. So if you're going to tell me that the replacement player – by the definition, is established at a zero, wouldn't you think that every member of the Boston Red Sox should have come up a little closer to, to 108 than 57? Makes sense to me. Uh, it makes too, too much sense, though, Bill. You're making way too much sense there. Uh, the book is called State of Play by former Oriole Bill Ripken. Of course, you can catch Bill on MLB Network, and hopefully in the not-too-distant future, we're talking some, some baseball again. Real quick, uh, Billy, your sense, if, you know, some date off in the distance, uh, it was time for players to return to spring training, how much time do you think they need to get ready for a season? You know, I think pitchers are going to need a little bit more. I think the position player will probably tell you two weeks once they get it going. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that they were out there. I think they can find that uh, pretty easily. And I wouldn't be surprised either. It's going to have to be somewhat condensed, I believe, uh, to try to get as much season in if that's the decision that comes out. And it wouldn't surprise me any if maybe uh, some teams were allowed to expand the roster a little bit, maybe carry some extra pitchers uh, to go in there because the pitchers are the ones that need a little bit more time. But I would say for a position player, two weeks, maybe you play 10 games, um, get about 35, 48 Bs, they should be able to get it going. Bill Ripken, we appreciate it so much. And again, we hope you and your family are well during this time. You too, guys. Stay safe. Well, it's always fun talking to a Ripken, and that's any Ripken, Jeff. And, and Bill, who's just so good at the broadcasting side, explain the game. I really enjoy his work on MLB Network. And uh, he's just a great talker and communicator and loves the game so much. And it's obvious when you speak with him. I thought what he really crystallized pretty nicely was, you know, how the, the two different trees, the old school and the new school, and how you might have somebody, if he's hypothetically a manager and we're two of the people that are providing him information to use in the game, and we give him five things, and he's going to say, well, I'll take this one and this one. The other three I'm not necessarily so sure about because I know how the first two are able to help us win games. And I think that he kind of put that in a perspective that makes it easy to understand where you don't totally dismiss some of the new analytics and technology and things like that. But the thing that the old school has is they have the, the in-game knowledge of sitting in the dugout, spending lots of time around there, and they know what things that you're feeding them that they can use to be successful. And I thought that the way that he put that and he was able to use that analogy of those two different trees really made it easy to understand. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, for a long time, I know he was a coach on Team USA. A lot of people feel he's, he's like his father, Cal Sr., and just someone who's born to coach and to teach the game. Uh, there was always rumors about, uh, about Bill getting in and going down that path. I know he's got a, a great gig right now at MLB Network, but I'd be curious to know if he still has that itch at all at this point in his life and his career. But uh, we'll save that for the next conversation and podcast with 
Billy Ripken. I think he's Bill now. I'm not even sure. He, he was Billy I he's going by when Bill. I was growing up. I, I think he goes by Bill now. Okay. Well, uh, Bill, Billy, William, we love having him on. And the book is called State of Play. It really is a good read. Uh, if you're looking for something uh, to kick back with uh, at this time, uh, that's a good one that's out there right now uh, by Bill Ripken. Well, Jeff, uh, that was a fun week of podcast, and we have a, a bunch more coming up. So uh, always a pleasure, and we'll talk soon, my friend. We will indeed, and hopefully uh, technologically we're going to remain fine. Uh, we, we've kind of, we might have to do like a battery of tests at some point to figure out who's a little bit more technologically savvy, you and me, because it, it sometimes it feels like we're rubbing sticks together to create the fire. But you know what? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a learning experience for us as we try and get ourselves up and running. But a special thanks as well to our terrific digital crew which has been with us every step of the way in this. Yeah, we made big, big strides this week, I feel, on the technical side. It's looking better. I think it's sounding better. And uh, it, it sounds all good to me right now. It's just fun talking some baseball. So, Jeff, uh, we'll catch up soon. This has been Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Lite. Thanks for being with us. 